rearrange this panel a little bit. I'd like to introduce you to David Freeman. Mr. Freestone. Um, Freestone. Freestone. Goodness, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Didn't change it so, since um, from the International Law of the Sea, an environmentalist, a, uh, a specialist at the IUC, uh, uh, no, sorry, yeah, that's right. um, rapporteur from the, or responsible, the I'm IUCN, rapporteur of the committee, right, yeah. An yeah. executive secretary of the Saragasso Sea Commission. Commission. Thank you for <laughs> helping me there. Thank you so much. Uh, Marcus Raymond is the director of the TBA 21 Academy. Uh, John Parmazino is the founder of the Territorial Agency, who together with Armin Linke and Bruno Latour was part of the establishment of the Anthropocene Institute. Um, professor also at the uh, Architects Association in London. And David Gruber, well, before I do anything really terrible here, because I always get the universities all mixed up. Opera singer. Yeah, world famous <laughs> opera singer. Specialized in whale songs. Specialized in whale songs. Wait, where did I have a job? Here we go. David, sorry. David, apart from being a dear friend, who thanks for uh, Janina Chaipa introducing us. Um, who, with whom he's worked and collaborated with and we'll see a performance tonight. Um, there's an underwater photographer from, and works um, at the U City University of New York as professor um, and he's also a National Geographic Innovation Challenge Grant winner and a National Geographic Explorer and Expedition co-expeditor co with us and discoverer together with Marcus Raymond of the bioluminescent turtle, biofluorescent turtle, bioluminescent. So um, really the, the introduction that I would just like to give, first of all, I'm sorry that some of you may have already seen this and I have gone over it again once before, but for the benefit of those who were not here, this symbol uh, was discovered on the floor over there, there are a number of very early Christian symbols carved into the stone here. And this symbol is actually from the early part of Christianity, uh, maybe 2,000 years ago, um, the symbol of Pisces, which is rather interesting to find that here in the church. But the interpretation by our astrologer was that God needs our help um, and to interconnect us. So we need to collaborate and work together. And so maybe under this symbol, I'm going to start this, this talk because it was uh, rather interesting that the era of Pisces, which began 2,000 years ago, was replaced by the, uh, as we know from the, from the musical Hair. Um, you know, that this is the age of Aquarius, which was the actual age of uh, Anthropocene interestingly enough, which I didn't know. So going back 2,000 years, maybe we should take this as our message for this final panel on how collaboration is possible. Um, the ocean space that's being proposed um, without going into the architecture of it, uh, the designs which I find um, would distract from the real purpose, um, is, is something that we've been working on for quite some time in terms of conceiving and, and finding its original purpose. And as the oceans connect us all, as nations, as cultures, with philosophies and religions, um, it was an idea originally to give the oceans a physical place to be celebrated and recognized. It's, uh, there was a lot of discussions originally legally being proposed to become an in, to have a statehood because with a certain statehood would come levels of protection and rights and so on. And why shouldn't the oceans have their own series of rights and laws and so on? And that's rather, of course, a utopic idea, um, but I wanted to create a space in Venice where there are so many national pavilions and everybody is always fighting for their, you know, there's all this very, it's quite nationalistic actually if you think about all these countries and these pavilions in scattered around this, this city of Venice. And the history of Venice being 
so interconnected with the oceans and being such an important maritime power. And the fact that I found this church that I believed Marco Polo might have been buried in, there were so many things sort of coming together on how to create a space which allowed for all of us together to contribute and to, um, to be part of, in a very open and generous sense, uh, celebrating the oceans by, in, in, in a sense, giving our independent and very individual um, contributions to giving the oceans a voice. And if the oceans could speak, you know, what, what would they want and want us to be representing and what would they want us to be discussing? And being an art organization, I was very afraid that, you know, there would be a huge pressure in from the Biennale systems of art and architecture as well as, you know, from the independent uh, museums like the Prada Foundation um, and the, the Pino, which also did this horrendous um, oceans project with Damien Hirst. But um, how do you counter that and how do you create an institution that not only is valuable for the citizens of Venice, whose study and whose life is obviously very affected by climate change and rising sea levels, but also res recognizing its historical context of, of being a huge maritime power, and the Doges whose historical wedding to the ocean happens symbolically every year with a golden ring that was thrown into the ocean as they remarry the ocean. So there's so many symbols together that I thought this would be the ideal place where art and the creative industries that we all work with could actually contribute something and see the oceans through the lens of art, but also through the lens of science and through the lens of research. Um, and to, we were talking all week uh, about interdisciplinarity and into uh, a porous and e ecology of thinking, bringing uh, so many disciplines and traditions together under one. So the, having a focus on the oceans is giving us an opportunity to put this really to the huge test. Um, so I would like to ask, actually, if David would like to go first and uh, make his presentation, because you have also, oh no, I was gonna bring you on that. Yeah, yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. we'll start at the other end of the table. No, there's a reason to this madness. John. Yes, um, I, I, I think in the, um, no, sorry, I'm going to do this again differently, Marcus. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I know, you were just I'm starting just to make your speech. notes, I'm making your views. Do you need a bit more time then? <laughs> because um, after we've worked and created the um, TBA 21 Academy a few years ago, um, I realize that the practice that we've been building up and developing is really the one that should inform the ocean space because apart from having uh, physical expeditions and having that constant relationship with the sea and being able to bring extraordinary people together um, on their Dardanella vessel, I think that maybe just to begin with, if you could give some, under, you know, share your, our position on the academy and where we stand and what are the relationships that we're building um, and so that there's an understanding of where this is coming from and out of that will then occupy this space. Yeah, okay. Hello again for the last time. Um, yeah, so the TBA 21 Academy was uh, founded in 2011 by Francesca and myself. Uh, and uh, picking up on something that Sebastian said earlier, um, maybe out of the notion uh, or, or the question, um, can an art organization also do something um, purposeful or meaningful instead of just uh, being useless, right? Um, and uh, so the, the idea was to, to combine art, science, exploration, and conservation. And as Francesca said, the main content provider of, of this uh, endeavor is actually is a boat, is uh, the Dardanella, and the Dardanella um, gives us the opportunity to go um, out into the field, expose us to the elements, immerse ourselves in in um, in oceanic maritime experience that uh, that is uh, very unusual. Right? 
and um, and this started with the circumnavigation of Iceland, and now we've uh, since four years been been in the Pacific. But um, but the the idea was really to uh, build on the convening power that TBA twenty one has. It's a it's a fantastic magnet, and has built over the over the years over the fifteen years that uh, Francesca and Daniela had been working on this before, or the twelve years before this started, had had built a fantastic solid network of of extremely diverse people. And um, and building on this network, it was really uh, the attempt to to bring um, very different positions together in a in a very um, uh, intense experience out in 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 the field uh, where where one by exposing ourselves to the elements and by leaving all our comfort zones, by, uh, but uh, especially not having walls around us most of the time, uh, are able to think and um, and experience. The ocean. The ocean. Why the ocean um, is a. Francesca and I are very passionate about the oceans. It's the one thing. But but the other thing, and David will be able to talk about this later more, is also that it is this um, constantly moving, ever changing, always in motion system that um, we understand with. Borders. It has, uh, you know, it ends at the horizon line and at the at the at the shores. Um, but once you start looking at it, um, you understand that it's so intri intricately interconnected that it doesn't stop at the borders. It doesn't stop at the horizon line, and it uh, it is so interconnected that everything you do in this system has an impact. Um, and so it it. Um, it forces us to radically change our perspective and to radically understand ourselves as part, as an active part of a system, right? And from this experience, um, we, uh, I, th I thought it was necessary to uh, to start talking about and in investigating the effects of climate change, right? And uh, and um, by. Um, and getting out of this kind of paralysis of how to deal with this with this huge um, abstract term, right? What is what is climate change? What can we do? How can we do? How can I engage as an individual? How can we engage as a as an institution? And um, and to do so, we we really um, started creating these alliances between art and science, but then also um, lawmakers. We started branching out uh, after after this these first expeditions. We started branching out into conservation, um, and uh, I, two days ago I started talking about like thinking and creating the shape of taking on the shape of shape of an octopus, um, and I think this is really this is the ambition to create uh, a number of arms that are equally. Uh, of of quality that that they can stand alone in the field, but they're they're connected, interconnected, and connected by um, by a nervous system that stands for values, that stands for ethics, that stands for method, that stands for discipline, and that can uh, can actually relate to each other and, and create a system within itself that um, that has an impact and hopefully a positive impact. So after after creating this ex, um, exploration program as an art organization, we uh, we reached out into the conservation world and and um, really created a conservation project in Jamaica that is now um, it's now law. It's a six square kilometer um, fish sanctuary. Uh, it's a no take zone. This comes with a certain set of uh, new questions that that we have to deal with as an organization. And there again, there is this. There's this uh, interconnectedness between uh, cultural us as cultural practitioners uh, with a, with um, an experience in exhibition making and uh, publication making uh, and and all that. And how do you apply this now to uh, to a conservation area? How do you apply this to a community? How how can we um, put other specialists in there and really? Look at it this uh, from from this way. Then um, from there we went into policy making, and um, as mentioned two days ago, we applied for um, for an observer status or to be an observer at the International Seabed Authority, um, which we were granted. So now we're the first uh, art organization ever to to have this observer status at a United Nations body, uh, which gives us the opportunity to really bring a different language to this rather. Um, hermetically closed system, right? And and um, again, how can this uh, 
this institution, like uh, uh, Daniela said yesterday, I believe, that is uh, ever critical with itself, always questioning itself, apply this to uh, to a different framework, right? And um, and uh, what would it do to the General Assembly of the International Seabed Authority if we applied for speaking time and unleashed Hillary on them, right? Uh, what would that do? Um, uh, Daniela is shocked, looks shocked, but um, but uh, this is like I mean these are the questions that we that we kind of need to need to ask ourselves, right? And um, and so we we're trying to expand this um, this uh, relationship between art, science, uh, law, policy, um, trying to work within the the ever frustrating body of the United Nations, um, but but really to to see how can we make dents in these very rigid otherwise systems, right? Um, it is, um, it's really nice to see that uh, we, we could talk about Nabil Ahmed's work earlier and then have you now here because I think this is like uh, A, this relationship with, uh, with you and the International Law Association, but then on the other hand working on, on a more um, speculative but uh, nevertheless um, very, you know, it's like uh, we, we take this very seriously, this, this um, uh, this project with Nabil. This is the this is the the kind of possibilities that we have as an as an art organization and something that we can then bring to to a wider audience, I believe. Um, what is Nabil's project? Just Nabil's is the Inter-Pacific Ring Tribunal. It's a it's a proposition for for a uh, for an environmentally informed tribunal on uh, on four cases in the Pacific. Right now, uh, proposing a different form of um, um, framework, legislative framework, right? Um, um, what else is there to say? And that's all the research and the archives. The, the research and the archive, okay. Um, obviously, all of this is not just pure speculation, but it's based, in, uh, it's based uh, also in fact, but um, taking into consideration other forms of knowledge as well. Um, there, therefore, we, that's why, why we go to the field to also um, experience other forms of knowledge and ancestral knowledge, uh, um, traditional knowledge, um, and um, to, we, we're starting a project with, with John, how to create a, um, a research unit, an archive, Archive, I have, I'm not really happy about the word archive, but more, more of a research unit where we can layer all of these um, different forms of, of knowledge that are currently rather siloed and rather fractaled. How can we actually build like a, um, I don't know, a translational tool or a vessel that is able to um, traverse all of these um, silos and, and create um, like let's say unusual juxtapositions of information that that really a uh, bring a new a different um, more holistic picture but also can create new circumstances in within it um, yeah that's thank i think you. thank you very much marcus um, the the ocean space that i dream of and imagine is obviously inspirational and full of hope and um, I'm looking to work with uh, Jana Vindran, who will con do, do a performance and a concert tonight that you will see and understand the sort of emotional empathy that we want to generate in people, feeling uh, uh, passion and love for the ocean. So sharing that empathy in, in a creative way. Uh, also want to make exhibitions, because this is kind of the business we're in, uh, but as well have a research institute, which Marcus just um, referred to, all within the same building and all within the same space, interacting with one another. So there is a choice to be allow yourself to be seduced into something, and then maybe that would trigger further curiosity, which if you really had time to spend, you could spend and go further and deeper into by, by entering the research facility. And all of this, many of the art projects that I've done with Daniela over the years, where we were looking into the archive of all the commissions that we've made, there's a huge amount of research that's gone into every single one of them. And somehow in the way of exhibition making today, it's either part of the project and exhibited on the walls and whatever is not on those walls sort of sometimes makes its way into the catalog. But much of it is sort of set aside. 
And we think that's really sad. And we've been discussing together how to actually enrich these commissions with by demonstrating and by rendering accessible all the research that went into it and all the side images that might not have been chosen for the exhibition and everything else that goes, all the experiences, the, the books that were read, the films that were watched, the music that was listened to, the trips that were made, all of that forms part of that work at the end of the day. And this is something that we really feel that understanding the oceans also is not just being seduced by a wonderful sound piece, but also going into all the work that's gone into, like Jana's legacy of, of all the work and research she's done as a marine biologist as well as an artist. So I've sort of put that over to John and um, as well charged him with a group of researchers to, to actually develop part of the research program because Mount Chauvet is also directed from the academy and the expeditions that we make. But this is sort of the beginning, and we're sharing with you sort of this initial infrastructure that is coming. So I'd like to see, do you need screens and shots? And you need this thing. Is that the one? Here you go. Thank you. I'll try and keep it to about 10, 12 minutes, yeah. if that's OK. I wanted to, first of all, really thank Francesca and Marcus for Mm. the setting and uh, I am really happy that yeah. I would somehow speak in uh, public about this oncoming project uh, first from a Franciscan church and this because of ultimately peace what we are uh, all working towards is uh, not only avoiding conflict but peace and today in my understanding to avoid conflict means very simply to keep oil in the ground. And this is where we first uh, started discussing the ocean when Francesca and Marcus walking into our Museum of Oil uh, told us where are the oceans? Where are the oceans in the Museum of Oil? We are talking about possibilities of negotiation, about the possibility of uh, having to keep oil in the ground but not being able to keep oil in the ground without changing our lives, and yet where are the oceans? And so since that you know, pungent remark, we've been really thinking, how do we think of the oceans in such a way that we'll be able to face the complex and difficult conditions of having to work towards peace? At the time of the Anthropocene, where Conflicts are no longer extension conflicts, no longer conflicts of, uh, say, accession, but intensity. And uh, to me, this is a, a crucial distinction because it's a, uh, mainly a spatial uh, distinction, is what I would call uh, an architectural distinction. So today I wanted to start with a very simple remark about the conditions that I've been listening to uh, over the last two days uh, in the ILA conference, and I've been listening uh, about polity and how polity needs to change its forms, its structures, its institutions, because of a foreseen change in space. And to me, those two words, the, the polity, the way through which we live together, the pieces, the, the church, the ecumen, and space are, by definition, two dynamic conditions. They're always changing. They're changing through social interaction, but of course they're changing through the production of space, they're changing through the material reconfiguration of those spaces, and they are what I would call an architecture. They are constructed conditions, and more, even more so at a time where constructing these spaces is influencing not just the human environment, but the earth. And this is my little homage to uh, ILA, 1608. I think uh, all of the lawyers in this wonderful space would understand what I'm referring to. This is uh, your hero, Ugo Grotius, and it's particular uh, portrait of uh, Grotius. It's actually in the uh, one of the most beautiful museums in, 
in the Netherlands. But the Netherlands are also this. This is not 1608, this is 1972. And this is the bottom of the sea in the Netherlands, the former Southern Sea, the former Southern Sea, which is now the site of the youngest city in Europe, Almere. And you see here probably the last remnant of an attitude towards the sea, towards the ocean as extension. No? It's a new frontier. No, let's go out and take it. Let's go out and say, reclaim it as land. And it's a frontier, but the frontier of um, the making of the Netherlands is no longer simply a condition of you know, preservation of uh, security of the Dutch or condition of uh, managing um, exchange uh, with other people or infrastructure, as uh, Hillary would have mentioned. It has turned into a very complex set of rather intense industrial and warfare relations spanning across the globe. Of course, the Dutch would look at the sea in order to, for instance, go to Canton with the East India Company. Today, when we think of Guangzhou, which is the new name of Canton, we cannot think of anything else than the complex formation of what uh, our friend Bruno Latour would call a cosmopolis, uh, the complex transformation of what used to be a delta into a set of material processes and this is where maybe some of these images might resonate with the discussions that were held two days ago, are transforming radically the dynamics of the coastline. Dynamics not only because of emissions of CO2, but uh, in increased subsidence because of transformation of uh, porous land into hard land with asphalt. What you see in blue is everything that was built in the last 10 years uh, in this part of China. And the transformations uh, of uh, what we thought was a city are now extended to the water system, the watershed, the oceans in its complex uh, formation, the atmosphere. And what I would indicate here is that maybe 1987 is also an equally important date, and that is the formation of uh, the moment of the Chinese shifting uh, their production system. But 2011 and the reorganization of their uh, political system might be equally important as 1608 in your uh, foundational condition. So what I'm trying to uh, point out here is that when we're thinking of the um, ocean space, in my mind, we're thinking of 100% urban space. 100% natural space at the same time, in the sense that the Anthropocene no longer allows us to make that clear-cut extensive division. It's no longer a condition where on one side there's a city and on the other side there's wilderness. The multiple relations are being modified so rapidly. And so what does it mean to have peace where you can no longer distinguish who's your friend and who's your enemy? when we can no longer think of, for instance, the uh, footprint of rapid urbanization in China over the, the last 20 years as being only a land-based urbanization, but being affecting deeply the transformation of disease. And this is, in my mind, where the second focus that we are going to develop uh, brings us to 1941, at sea, again, uh, and is. Uh, Winston Churchill, of course, about to meet Franklin Delano Roosevelt for the apparently secret uh, UN uh, summit, the United Nations summit. The United Nations are nations united against Nazi fascism. And the so-called um, Atlantic Charter, um, the uh, declaration that they uh, put forward, is a very uh, complex uh, uh, document but if you look carefully, this is uh, the scribbled notes of uh, uh, Churchill in, himself trying to amend the different articles. But Article 4, surprisingly untouched. The, 
the nations uh, will endeavor, with due respect to their existing obligations, to further the enjoyment by all people of access on equal terms to the trade and to the raw materials of the world, which are needed for the economic prosperity. I would count this as the foundation of the Anthropocene. Maybe uh, the actual ink is the moment where the notion of the Anthropocene is inscribed in law. Uh, and uh, it's a, no, not by chance that it happens at sea, uh, and it's not by chance that the UN flag is dominated by a sea perspective. Right in the middle, there is the Arctic Ocean. And ultimately, from the discussions that I listened to in the last days, it all comes down to this, the continental slope. Now, this is just off the coast of Nova Scotia. Uh, it's the same space where modern uh, 70 years ago, uh, Churchill and Roosevelt met. This, uh, the continent, in white, you see the continental shelf of what is today uh, Canada, and then the slope and the different sounding mechanism. The question is, I can show you these images. I can go on, uh, maybe demonstrating this. But each one of these images is showing you a radically different space of the ocean, radically different. And this morning, and we were discussing you know, with David on the other side, you know, his vision of the ocean as a biologist. And so the question uh, that uh, we are facing here is a question of how do we make narratives, how do we make a very simple storytelling out of this very complex different oceans. And it's not different points of view on the same oceans. It's really radically diverse oceans that are meant by the different people. And, uh, and so what we are starting uh, in the collaboration with TBA21 is really an effort to somehow unpack that idea that the oceans are one. The oceans is really plural. It's a plural, uh, multiple space. and the different ways through which we measure it, through which we uh, sound it, in which we fathom it, are most of the time speaking across our possible friends and speaking across our possible enemies. So the question that we ha are having is, for instance, how do we um, make different archives, different uh, trajectory intrude onto one another? How do we create uh, first a digital, but then a uh, most uh, probably also uh, publications or discussions, uh, that spaces where different alternatives uh, can come one into the other. And this does, then brings us back to uh, where we started with uh, our friends of Greenpeace. And this is a very short video that shows you uh, almost an impossibility of thinking the oceans without thinking of intensity of conflicts, of war. This is uh, a, film, a short footage that you've seen from Greenpeace trying to fly over a uh, trawler vessel uh, off the coast of uh, uh, Murmansk in uh, the uh, Russian Arctic. And the trawler has been readapted to uh, form these very strange uh, convoys that blast every 30 seconds the waters in order to sound, you know, to measure the bottom of the sea, looking for oil. The, you might think that the uh, scientific endeavor attached to that will bring enormous advantages because maybe you don't find oil, but in the meantime, you've gained more conditions of knowing. Greenpeace, on the contrary, is there to try to stop them doing that because the very noise that it sounding uh, the, through sonar is provoking is destroying the possibility, the habitat of all the mammals uh, of uh, the Barents Sea. And, yeah, and the fish, but uh, in this particular case, I think uh, the question was really uh, about the mammals. Mm -hmm. the, so how does one link one point of view with the other. How do you establish the ocean space, which is a space of aesthetics? 
as a space of multiple negotiations. And this is where, uh, again, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Francesca and Marcus for thinking the ocean space as an aesthetic space, in the sense that it, what we have been discussing is that this Oceans are an aesthetic space in the sense that they register, they mark in their material forces the, our activities. Even more so at the age of Aquarius, as you would say. <laughs> but they are also aesthetic in the sense that they gather politically completely different audiences, new. And I think to think of uh, Today, a space of aesthetics is really a space of political engagement. So this is where we start, and we are going to be as transparent as we can in the formation of this. We are just at the very beginning, and we we'll hope that with everybody's help, we'll manage to build uh, a shared set of negotiation spaces. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Um, in, 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 in the ocean space next year, which would be a soft opening. We want to begin to demonstrate these projects and these researches with all our colleagues. And I think, if I may say, I know that, um, well, Davoy has suggested that possibly in September next year, we might actually hear the results of the, this be, uh, beginning of uh, discussions that happened here in Lompoud of the sea level rise. Uh, maybe, David, I could ask you to kind of give us, because we're a shared audience here. I'm sort of preaching to the converted, but also trying to inform um, your team without b boring mine. And now you may have the same challenge. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Francesca. And let me say, I mean, we've had the most amazing uh, meeting, and it's very successful. And a lot of it is just the ambience of this place, which is wonderful. So thank you for your your hospitality. Right, well, this is, a, this is a fairly esoteric issue that we've been discussing, but it's, um, it was brought together, I, I can say there's 20, uh, probably the foremost experts in the world on the water of the sea, so these people are really ocean experts as well. Uh, the, 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 the problem, if you like, has already been, been uh, put out, out on the table by, by Davor. Um, we work with the, the basic constitution, if you like, the basic legal regime for the oceans is the 1982 convention, took over 10 years really of discussions to actually negotiate, took 20 years to come into force, you know, it's still only got 160 parties, some doesn't include the US, but it's very, it's just basically the, the, the bedrock of the legal regime for the oceans. But it was based on the principle that nothing would change, right? As we've heard the, during the Eocene, you know, and certainly over the last 6,000 years, sea levels really haven't changed at all. So very tightly negotiated provisions on things like the measurement of states' entitlements to maritime zones. So I won't go through all the details, but they're entitled to claim a territorial sea and other. So it's, but basically, an ex, since 1982, they've been able to claim an exclusive economic zone, out to 200 miles, which is really a fisheries zone, as well as the continental shelf, which we saw. Uh, the continental shelf is really a, a geographical concept rather than the, the 200 miles. But this 200 mile zone has been, if you like, a godsend for some of the poorest countries in the world, particularly the island countries in the Pacific, because um, they tend to be the areas where most of the big tuna resources have been gathered, and so they, the small islands have been able to use their, their if, you, if you put a point in the ocean, uh, a small island, which is say half a mile across, it generates a quarter of a million square miles of ocean space, mm -hmm. right? So if you think of a collection of islands, most of them are pretty small, and then you create an ocean area around them, 200 miles from each of those islands, it's a very large area. And some of these smallest countries in the world have the biggest uh, EZs in the world. So this is really a resource issue. Now these countries are also the ones that have played the uh, least role in contributing to climate change, right? So these are very small uh, developed con developing countries, so they actually have made little contribution to the, to the carbon footprint, which, the, which we're now all inheriting. Now, one of the problems with the, uh, if you like, the measurement system that we've established, very firmly, very fiercely negotiated over a lot of many years, 
is it works on the principle of baselines. So you're allowed to claim zones from your low water mark because that pushes it out as far as you can. But you're also allowed to, cho to choose drying reefs and rocks, etc., and other points in order to push the zone out further. And we just, somebody just reminded us that in the negotiations, the geographers said these should be really substantial pieces of land, right? And the, the, the politicians said, no, no, anything will do. So the result is that most of, or many of the smaller countries are based their zones on very flimsy points, right? And these will disappear. So once we look at the uh, at, an, an, uh, at a sea level rise, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is talking about a, a metre, 98 centimetres, picky, right? A metre by 2,100, and they're probably wrong. It'll probably be more. And then 2,100, we're looking at two metres, and it'll probably be more than that. These things will start to erode. So what we're looking at is the way in which the the legal community, which has not had to address this issue before, how they should respond to this, to this problem. Uh, it's a completely novel problem. So um, should we rethink the whole zone issue? Not likely to happen. Should we look in terms of a new treaty? And the Law of the Sea Convention took 10 years to negotiate and another 20 years to come into force. And it's act they're talking, the UN is now talking about another treaty on areas beyond national jurisdiction, high seas, and it's taken them 15 years and they haven't even started negotiating yet. So this is not really a good way forward. So what we're looking at is the way in which we could see the development of new rules developed by state practice, right? So countries, particularly the ones that really are in the fire, firing line, could actually adopt a practice which would be relatively easy to do and have the maximum impact and particularly for those countries which are really the, 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 the poorest and the smallest, the smallest islands. So what we were thinking of, what we've been thinking of, and I think we had some great breakthroughs in the last couple of days, it's really been a tremendous meeting, is we should talk about freezing the baselines. Right? So as the sea comes in, and it, we, we should be talking about relative sea levels, sometimes change, changes will be the other way, but most of it will be erosion. So as the sea comes in, states should draw their baselines back, right? So as they lose all these points, the current law says you have to pull back. And this is called an ambulatory baseline. It moves with the ocean. Why? <laughs> because we presume that we're working on a system of complete geographical stability. Once we see the huge challenge which the sea level rise poses, maybe we should start to think about this completely in a different way. And so what we've been proposing, and I think we're nearly there, is that, uh, that coastal states should be able to freeze their baselines, right? So if they've drawn their baselines and they're supposed to deposit uh, map charts of these to the, uh, with the United Nations, once they've drawn their, their limits, their outer limits and their baselines, once they've done that, they should be able to stay with it. And we see some evidence that in the, in the South Pacific, with the encouragement, particularly the Australians, they've actually started to do that. They're saying, we've actually really carefully worked out what our maritime boundaries are, and this is what they are. And we, we use one example that we were discussing is the Marshall Islands, which is a small group of atolls. And their legislation is 45 pages long, because they've every single point they've really carefully delimited. Sorry? Call me a liar for, for, for a page? Come on. <laughs> 451 pages, right? So it's, yeah. See what we have to put up with these guys? <laughs> anyway, so this is good. So that's the sort of complexity that we're talking about. So what we're suggesting is, um, we're still working out the details of it, but we're basically there that states should be able to freeze their outer limits. So the small islands, which are the, the coral islands, for example, would still be entitled to the 200 miles as they've already claimed them, and to the fishery resources that they include, and the continental shelf resources as well, although in the Pacific that's not such an issue. Uh, whether we do this just by freezing the outer limits of these lines, which they have already declared, or whether we freeze the baselines, we're still looking at, because there are some technical issues involved in that. 
That's the first thing we've decided to recommend. And then the second recommendation is that where countries have negotiated maritime boundaries with each other, there is a suggestion, which is in uh, the literature, that where there has been a fundamental change of circumstances, a real, really serious change of circumstances, those treaties should be set aside. And some have suggested that sea level rise is such a change of circumstance. So two countries negotiate a boundary based on their baselines. The baselines change because of sea level rise. Should we set the treaty aside? And we're saying absolutely not that the whole concept of what we're trying to do is to work on certainty, the avoidance of conflict, as you were saying. Uh, I think I agree the avoidance of conflict is peace, right? But this is going to be a highly stressed situation that as, these, as the sea level rises, there are going to be a lots of other issues involved. So adding to, to this for the burden of small countries, if you like, the burden of having to consider their baselines, losing resources, etc., or perceived losing of resources, these, we, we think that we should stick with the system we currently, this is what we're going to be proposing, that we stick with the system we currently have. There are issues with that. Some, some states claim more than they're supposed to, and you know, there are other issues. But that's basically, we think, the most equitable solution in the circumstances, and that we, one which we think will be command the sort of support from particularly small island countries, but you know, most of the coastal states that are... Um, that, that are going to be threatened in this way. There's going to be problems with countries, the, the big navigation countries might have some issues with it. But basically, from a point of equity, given that this is a direct result of anthropogenic uh, climate change, of sea level rise, it means that the smallest, most threatened countries, most vulnerable countries, are not going to be the ones that suffer the, the result from that. So that's, that's where we are. We started to look at the, the more difficult question of what happens if the whole islands disappear. Um, and I think we've decided to, uh, the, the sensitivity of that is so difficult, and your kind of different perspectives of that have been very useful, that we've decided to put that on the back burner. We'll itemize what the criteria are and the issues that we should be looking at, but to suggest proposals at this point where it's not likely to happen probably for another 100 years. We'll see these light, these these base points disappearing probably within the next 10, 10, 15, 20 years, maybe sooner. Clive will correct me, as he already did, if that's sooner than that. But that's going to happen fairly soon. But it hasn't really happened yet. So if we can propose a solution which can be adopted now without being a change of the law in any way, as these changes happen, we are actually be able to, that countries will be able to benefit from this and, you know, and, and will preserve the, uh, the security that, of the regimes that they already have. So that's basically tremendous. And we did actually discuss the fact that maybe we should have an interdisciplinary committee that looks at this question of survival of statehoods because it's not really something that's a legal issue. All the options, you know, the political issues are such that everything's on the table. The UN, we could have the UN discussions we should have. You could bring in large, you know, uh, sociologists would look at this differently from lawyers, political scientists would look at this differently. Really, really legal solutions. There are lots of things you could do, but it's probably better if we don't go there yet. So it's been a tremendous meeting. You're delighted to show the results of this when we actually have it finalised. But um, thanks Thank again you. for your hospitality. <laughs> Thank you, David. Well, I really do hope that um, you'll be inviting the art community into some of your discussions because, uh, as we've seen with Hillary, this is, is, is also very productive in terms of reshaping some of the, and asking some questions, like you did at the International Seabed Authority. You were asking very relevant questions, and, and I think this is, this is something and a role that the art world can and does have and we're not shy at all, uh, it seems, given the community we've assembled for these last three days. <laughs> There's no shy people amongst any of us. So be, 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 be comforted in the knowledge that we can often go in and ask some questions that maybe you, you might want to uh, leave to other people. <laughs> but um, the other arm or the part of this octopus that we wanted to present to you today is, of course, science. 
without which all of the work and the creative lens that we may shine on the ocean to explore it, to study it, and to interpret it, and to celebrate it, can't be done without the truth and without proper science and research. Um, and we fundamentally believe that, and in, this, in that respect, I know that uh, Marcus has been forging quite a few um, relationships with universities whose departments uh, dedicated to ocean research um, are a priority. ISMAR is one of them, and Armin Linke was kind enough to introduce us to the president and the director of uh, ISMAR, the Institute of Marine Science of Venice. Um, David, I think you're going to have to stand up for the whole science community at large. Yeah, that's what I like. <laughs> and, um, you know, you have a number of research projects which are absolutely fascinating, but I've asked you to touch on those and to show everybody and show. I'd like to maybe put some of the lights off because I think you need to see some of the. Okay, is the yeah, screen? Yeah, you can turn the lights down good? a little bit. Can we turn these lights off? Right maybe here? these bright ones, just for the sake of the images. <gasps> that, oh my God. Don't kill the participants, Catherine. That's very kind. Uh, I do. Um, and then uh, David has been invited um, to actually build a lab inside a cultural space, which I think is really interesting because we were talking about earlier about how very often artists be invited into laboratories or research institutes to do some work. And this art-science relationship hasn't always been a happy and fruitful one because the artists tend to jump, you know, parachute in, spend time, absorb all the data and information they can, take up researchers' time, and then go off with, you know, having made a work or an exhibition and something, and they're never heard of again. So maybe you would also like to spend some time to talk to us about your next project. Yeah, sure, Please sure. Please scintillate the minds here with yeah, some of your yeah. extraordinary research. Yeah, first, um, I want to thank you, Francesca and Marcus, being the, being the last talk. I feel like uh, you know, I, I really have a responsibility to, um, to recognize this space that we're in. I mean, this, um, in, in the thought that's gone on, this is a monastery that goes back for several hundred years. And I, I just learned that the early monks were actually gardeners here. And um, they were growing some interesting medicinal herbs. And some of these herbs were actually taken up by Shakespeare in Romeo and Juliet, is that right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that is just a real metaphor if you think of Romeo and Juliet, of these lovers dying for their, for their, their standards and, um, and living by their heart or not even want to live at all. And, um, and I thank Francesca for organizing this and seeing the potential of this space. And as far as I know, this is the first um, institution as Agent of Change slash Sea Level Conference I've ever been to. Has anyone else, anyone else here been to another Agent of Change slash Sea Level? So that alone is, uh, is such a unique thing. And um, you know, everything you touch is a piece of art, even though I've heard you called many things from a collector to a mega collector to um, creator. You know, I mean, I think um, the way you live your life is in real artistry, and same with Marcus, and how you put your effort into this is a real shine of, sign of the, the care. And my research as a marine biologist, I guess I see myself as a student of the ocean, and the ocean is there to kind of teach me. And my career has been all over the place from the origin of life, and I studied biological oceanography, and I just sort of go with the waves now, and whichever direction the ocean tells me to go, I move in that direction. And I'm really trying to understand the ocean and the animals in the ocean from their perspective and um, kind of feel what they're feeling. Because why do we care about the ocean? Why is it that we're even here um, thinking about seeing level rise? We're thinking kind of about people in that sense. We're like, oh no, everyone's gonna have to move their house. If we didn't build our house in concrete, we would just probably go a little higher up the hill. Um, but that's raising these ideas of us being worried about the ocean kind of conquering us. Um, I'm thinking about the ocean in terms of like this blue, vast space. And I won't even think about like, what does it mean to be in the ocean? If I can plug this light in, it'll look a little bit like, oh no, maybe not too much. Anyway, I was gonna shine a big blue light on me because um, you know, I wanna feel, what does it feel like to be in the ocean? And as we swim, and there we go. 
<laughs> so there, there. Now I'm like, now my life is a sea creature, and you're kind of just living in this one world of just blue light. And um, as you drop down there, if we want to understand what animals live, how they see, we kind of have to put ourselves into this blue environment and try to get behind the eyes of some of these animals. And some of my work, and I'll try to be quick because I know I we want to go eat this, um, this lamb that's also gave its beautiful life and um, that we're going to eat later. And thinking about communication in the blue and this commitment to the moon that all these sea creatures have. So I want to think of one is as we drop down underwater, the ocean is this vast, the, the sun is this vast array of white light, but that white light has every color in the spectrum. But as we go underwater, this ocean is this magnificent filter, and it's going to filter out the reds, and then it's going to filter out the violets, um, and you're left with kind of a pure blue. So thinking about these animals, I went around swimming with blue lights for a while and found over 180 species of new fish, and we called this paper the covert world of fish biofluorescence. Way to be a little nerdy with the title to satisfy the other marine biologists about this phenologically widespread. But, um, in finding those species, we found all these others, and it's kind of like seeing a world from their perspective. So the moon as well, um, there's so many blue photoreceptors in these animals, and the moonlight also translates into blue light. So they see the world in these different ways in which we see them. And here's like a seahorse. And we might see an animal like this, but this, this kind of lighting never exists for that animal. So if you look at it through another perspective, you would see that fish like that and see these hidden patterns and, and, um, and details there. And this led me up to this shark, which was one of my first things of how do we get behind the eyes of these animals? How do we start feeling like a marine mammal? And that was complicated because you might just be like, whatever, dude, you're just swimming around with a bunch of blue lights and you've been maybe hanging out with Marcus and, you know, French, you know too much and you're just, um, you're just a little crazy with this blue, but I wanted to get behind the lights of this. I'll turn this blue off so you can see better. There, it's a little better for the images. So in thinking about this shark, it's like I wanted to think about its life. So this is a chain cat shark and to kind of look at its development, and I even think of like the artistry of these animals. So this is the shark. Sharks do such magnificent things. They could have, um, they could do viviparous reproduction. They could have sex and give life to a live birth. They could have it in an egg where it develops halfway in the shark, or they could even put out these little egg cases where, which is fun for us weird scientists, so we could watch this shark develop in its case. And you could see here just this kind of artistry of this shark developing. So here it is, the egg kind of forming that beautiful, vulnerable shark into a larger shark. And I then studied the eyes of this shark, and um, this was my first foray to look at the eyes and think about how this shark was actually seeing the blue world. And I made a shark eye camera um, and went down and swam with the shark and found that as we go down, that shark is, has a hidden signal for other sharks so they can see each other and they can see their patterns better than other sharks. So they have like this hidden mode of seeing each other. Um, and if I went down, I would see all these patterns that you have, but if I looked at something else, I may not see them. Um, so it allows them to um, be able to find each other. They're quite shy, reclusive sharks. And this kind of led me to thinking about turtles, which is another random thing. And I think of science and what science is. Really, science is just a representation of what humans have focused their sentient minds on and kind of learned a little bit about. And I was so surprised to think about a sea turtle. Does anyone here really love a sea turtle? Yeah. What, why do you love these things? What is it about a sea turtle? They're robust, right? There's only seven species of sea turtles. So it kind of doesn't interest taxonomists, really, because they're quite boring since there's so few diversity in them. But they're these. Um, I'd love to say yes, but but um, they're, they came from birds and crocodiles, um, so they they're avian kind of in, and they have some crocodilian things, and you can see the kind of remnants of the crocodiles there. And um, but they're cool because they're one of thinking of visual perspectives. These are one of the most challenging creatures because they see above water and they see below water. 
Um, so they have to have this eye, and we have a whole way our lenses of our eye is adapted for us to be these diurnal creatures. But let's see, can we get volume? Volume. Wait, wait, go back. Somehow I'm not getting volume. Have we got volume, Philip? Can we have sound? This here. was. Here's a little that instance, you know, it kind of describes itself. Here's Marcus. That was so fucking cool. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Gruber, to take me, give me a glimpse into Andrew. your world. Uh, my pleasure. That was... I'm sorry to drop the... I'm the first person in this conference to actually have this Marcus whole, inadvertently whole, drop an F-bomb. Um, what we're having here is we were swimming in the South Pacific, and Marcus and I stumbled across a new feature in a sea turtle that no one had ever seen before. So sea turtles go down in history as these, you know, these, these mythological creatures. They're, they're one of the only animals to cry, so they're worshipped. And um, they actually helped the headhunters get their first form of currency as they traded the shells for axes. Um, so they're just like, you know, people get tattoos of turtles, and yet there's this feature of this animal that us humans had yet to even understand. And as I kind of dropped into this, I wanted to know more about them. Um, one is this, it's made kind of, you know, a really fun splash and it, it made it all the way onto Saturday Night Live in the US, which is a, a fun um, parody. I don't know if people know about that one. But I then decided that we always have to go one step further and get obsessed with things. And in thinking about trying to understand what a shark sees, try to feel like these marine creatures, why do we want to save this ocean? Do we want to save this ocean for us? Do we want to save it for the animals? Do we want to connect to the animals? These are kind of important questions that we, we need to really think about. And, um, and I think seeing my science is a way to subtly connect us in. If we can see or kind of walk in the shoes of these animals, maybe we'll even want them, you know, to empathize with them more. And as I went, and well, this is kind of a weird story as well, because I then tried to become a turtle expert. And I realized that we didn't know anything about the vision of sea turtles. So I brought, and I kind of reached out outside of my safe space into the, the best like opt optologist that would study eyes. And I brought him with me because they're endangered species. So I had to find this one place where they actually kill two turtles a week and sell them for food so people don't poach them and brought him to this island because I couldn't do this in the US. I can't even get like a little tiny ounce of blood due to all the endangered species laws. And I brought all the instrumentation there, and we look into the eye, and in the eye are these little oil-colored oil droplets that potentially allow them to see this fluorescence um, much more magnified. So they're living in this completely different world, and they have this perspective of filtering out light, so it's more of what they don't see rather than what they do see, so it amplifies the signals that they're emitting. And we've been living all this time without even, like, recognizing that they have these signals. We did know that they do really other cool things, like the mother turtle could go to sea for 20 years and come back to the exact spot where she was born and lay her eggs there. So this is kind of fun, and I'm, this is part of a project still in development, and I built this crazy device. So I kind of reached out to this engineering community, and um, I actually put together a team of um, all-female engineers and built a turtle eye camera but I had to go deeper into the science and take this camera called a hyperspectral imaging camera that um, instead of just seeing in red, green, and blue, it sees much deeper than that. We call it a data cube. And that will allow me to get behind the eye of this turtle, but it'll also let me to get behind the eye of any animal in the world, as long as we know it's visual pigments. So um, I'm kind of excited about this, and I was talking to the two founders of Google about how cool it'll be to kind of like have these animal eye features in, um, you know, in different kinds of apps and so forth to, uh, to, to be able to start, you know, getting people more interested in about how other animals see the world. Um, you know, here's the camera in development. It just had a little leak. I was about to go test it this week after this trip, but I'm holding off on that. And to kind of think about another form of communication, this is another bizarre form of reaching out to other creatures. This is a fish called a flashlight fish. And what's really weird about this flashlight fish is it's got this garden of bioluminescent animals that live under its eye. And it's got this windshield wiper under its eye that they kind of swim around and they flash. And these have been known and people have kind of seen these for a while and had taken, you know, taken images of them. There's only about maybe nine or 10 papers of them. 
there's the cool, I grew this whole vein structure in the bioluminescent bacteria that live there to help feed oxygen so they glow this really bright blue. And if you swim with them, it's like being immersed in this like cloud of blue lights. You know, it's just this magical thing. And I actually stumbled across them in one of the remote, most remote parts of the world. But I decided to go back there with a camera that is the most latest technology, um, a camera that's usually on like microscopes. It's like a $100,000 camera that we use and it could see one photon of light. And I brought that camera there and I filmed them again. And this is with that camera and I was able to capture the whole school. So you can see this school of these fish moving around there. And I was kind of like, this looks really cool. It's almost like a swarm going on. And what's going on in the swarm? So I'm working on another project where we're actually using bioluminescence to start visualizing our brain firing. So we're reaching out to these marine animals to start understanding our own self and our own consciousness. And in finding that, this data being so rich, this is like, um, you know, like, like 60 gigabytes, this one little, one little piece right there. I then gave it to some of the best algorithm decoders that I knew because they're involved in this DARPA project that I'm, in, that I'm on. And I gave them this, this data and they started making all these images and it almost looks like little ballerinas. So even though it looks like such chaos, these fish are actually swimming perfect um, synchrony next to each other. And then we went even further and we were able to kind of draw out these patterns. There was leaders and there was a whole language and they're using language and light to be flying around there. So how they keep their lights on longer actually signals who's leading the school around. And one quarter of all the fish actually school together in these little groups for all different reasons. But this opens up the possibility that in the deep sea, there's also schooling fish that are swimming around down there. And now I've started commu um, communicating with a roboticist at Harvard, where I'm based, and we're making, being inspired by this to make little swarming robots um, that can actually swarm together a neural network being inspired by these, these kinds of um, fish. And this is all kind of like thinking about how much language there is and how much dialogue is going on that is just waiting for us. It's just waiting for us to reach down. And I'll just kind of end with this other idea as we think about, um, we brought up some ideas of how do we explore the deep ocean that we've never touched. And I was looking at some of those images of the, the deep sea that we saw on the first day of this conference and thinking of being the first human eye to ever see this part of our world and you know, having this machine that could go down miles underwater. And this is something that the legal scholars are gonna start thinking about. How do we regulate the mining when people start wanting to um, have the ability now to use technology to extract from down there? And I want us to think about even setting example for delicate exploration. So this is how we used to explore. Um, or how we still do explore. We go down with these mechanical arms and it's, it's really kind of, kind of rough. Like that's a bit rough. You know, we're using this oil and gas technology to kind of go down there. So I'm kind of challenging the, the marine community to like think about how we explore because how we live our life and how you two live your life is really setting an example for everyone else. You know, we're all these one little pieces of art. And if I could convince the marine community that we should start being more delicate, that would be a success. So I teamed up with a roboticist, and I guess the one thing that I like doing is kind of just reaching out to other scientists and try to learn their dialogue. And if I could kind of impress them enough to want to work with me, I feel like I've done my job. So I reached out to um, Rob Wood, who runs the micro robotics lab at Harvard, and um, I got him to to start making squishy robot fingers. And we just published this one year ago and it's become the most highly cited article in soft robotics. And soft robotics are kind of the future of robotic technology because when robots start taking over jobs, they're gonna be soft so they can work with people and you can smack somebody with a soft robot and you're not gonna get really hit in the face. So even now, as we move into this phase where ro robots are gonna take away jobs from people, we're thinking about soft and delicate, being gentle and treating nature nice. Um, so that moves me into jellyfish, which are just completely rad. And um, jellyfish and tinafores, and their ability of what they can do and their simplicity. And they go back, these animals go back 800 million years, 800 million. 
which is really like humans, we don't even go back a million years really. Um, we just go back as homo sapiens, just a couple hundred thousand. And this simplicity has allowed them to last for so long as we think about sea level rise and moving into the future. There's, there's so much to learn from these creatures. There's so much to, to think about how they live their lives. And these have the earliest nervous system. Not. Nah. Not at all, but these are giving off light. And this has led to a next step that I'm doing where I've gotten the best roboticists around to start thinking of how they could design soft robots to collect jellyfish without hurting them, which is moving to this next phase that I want to think about is I don't want to kill any more animals as a marine biologist. I want to be able to collect and study and use technology as a way to connect to nature rather than make us come apart, come apart like iPhones. Um, so it'll actually bring us closer to the animals. And thinking of a way that we could learn from life just by capturing them and getting some of their environmental DNA that they shed. We're all slothing cells as we walk around and oxygen and all these variables. And we could 3D print them and we could make algorithms and study them and share them with the world. So this is a cool one called the double flower. This is the colander one, because we have to start thinking about water flow as we push things through the water. We don't want to push the jellyfish away. Here's a single flower. And we just got funded to design these, and we're going to attach these to submarines and start interacting with the most delicate forms of human life. Thank you. Thank you. Well, this is definitely going to be a double performance tonight, David, because now we're really looking forward to you and Janina's performance. Um, David, you kept talking about these small island states, and we all love talking about great oceanic uh, nations, because obviously the, the way the Pacific people measure themselves is not by their territory, and that's so completely different from the way we look at the oceans. We look at it from a land base and they look at it from an ocean base. So they're really, we're two different cultures completely looking at each other, trying to resolve these issues. And I think, I'm, I'm so excited to feel part of that process, even just as your host. And, um, and uh, you know, John, I think this is an interesting and very fertile collaboration. Thank you so much for your presentation because it really, um, brought to life some of the great images that you brought in from the Museum of Oil, but how now we're venturing more into the oceans together with Armin, with Nabil, and uh, many of you here sitting tonight. Marcus, my partner in crime in all this, thank you for giving me always a safe hand when we're down in the ocean and I forget to check my oxygen air, and I've ended up diving on Marcus's octopus at least 20 times. And I get hell for it every time. I just get so carried away. So I'm a dangerous di diver in that respect. <laughs> you can't get me out of the water. Um, I, I think it's now dinner time, and I, I think we should just leave um, everybody thinking about these projects and these, this, how this ocean space is shaping up. Um, we will be at the COP23 conference from the 10th um, of October? November. November, sorry, yes. So if anybody is planning to be at COP23, the big ocean day is going to be on the 11th. And we will be having an interesting intervention there, which we will present to you sooner or later. But I first of all, really, last of all, I want to thank Daniela and uh, Boris for having assisted us in occupying this church with these two different worlds, uh, bringing the world of law, ocean research, and art, and the purpose of an institution to help us think about institutions being agents of change from all these different perspectives. Dar, you did an amazing. It's been absolutely fascinating. The panels have been really amazing, and I think everybody's feeling deeply enriched by this, and I think tonight's conversation at dinners, again, merging these two groups. Davor, thank you so much 
for trusting me and making all this um, a collaborative effort to enlighten both our sides on, on, on each other's work. And it is an honor and a privilege to have hosted you here and your group. So also welcome very much to all of you uh, to this wonderful place. Thank you for all your contributions. There's a microphone if around. If I could just say just There's one sentence. It is, is it? the micro mic is on. Is oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. This one is wonderful, yes. You like that one? Yeah. This, one mm. is, this one is, it's, it's, it's a pure improvisation. And actually, our cooperation started just like that. It was an entire improvisation. Um, after that, we agreed a year ago that we intend to cooperate. And then, after you have been receiving kilometer-long messages from me, you haven't given up. <laughs> and this means that because we are here now, we are set to cooperate for a very long time. And I look very much forward to that. I'm very interested, and also our International Law Association Committee, in your plan of the ocean space. We look forward to contribute to it. We understand that um, sea level rise, but also other issues like uh, ice melting, um, uh, there, were, there, were, there were several questions which you were raising about corals. All of them are relevant for our work as well. So very different perspectives are at, uh, at play here, which we have. But the, the aim is common, really. And I must say, John, he reminded me how skeptical I am as a lawyer. I was saying avoidance of conflict. And then you had to remind me as an architect that in the United Nations Charter it, was, it is written maintenance of peace. Well, but there's no peace in the council. probably I wanted, I wanted to avoid to being like on miss on the world universe or you know, competition. <laughs> so, but of course, the aim is joint. We have many things which, which are shared. And we really now, after, after this wonderful event which we had here, the most productive session really of our committee, in the fourth session so far, up to four years. We very much look forward to continuing cooperation. Thank you very much. So this is the proof of concept that multiple fields of cooperation can happen. We were discussing in my working group today that we have strength in numbers, and the more we can work together under that symbol of Pisces, the, the stronger we are. And I look forward to, to any collaboration and any forward collaboration with everybody here in this space and more in the future. So thank you for all of the inspiration to work together. Um, there we are. I'm going to close the conference. Thank you very much. Seminar. <laughs>